B2B marketers, welcome to B2B Beacon's Leadership Series. I'm your host, Thad Kalo, CEO of Business Online and Executive Editor of B2B Beacon. We are here in the lovely city of San Francisco, which happens to have tremendous innovation, technology, and many, many Priuses. So with that, even more so, we have a colleague of mine, which happens to be Cortland Smith, who is the Director of Demand Generation at OpenDNS, um, which happens to be a security, internet securities company. So pleasure, Cortland. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Fantastic. So the topic today that we wanted to talk about um, is, is measurement, alignment, performance, if you will, in the B2B world. And what I'd love to know, just to start off, Cortland, is you know, how is B2B marketing different than B2C in your mind? Well, they're very similar. And actually, I think that a lot of people think that B2B marketing is something that's more complex, something that's more involved, maybe something a bit drier. But what I see is that B2C marketing actually tends to be more advanced in certain areas. And there's, there's definitely a lot that B2B marketers can, can learn uh, from their, their B2C counterparts. So a couple areas of difference. Uh, B2C organizations uh, are marketing and, and selling without a, a established sales function. Uh, if they're going direct to, to the consumer, it's typically the marketer running the show. And that's a key difference in terms of how uh, how the organization is set up, how much influence people have in those resources. Roles. Absolutely. Yep. Um, if you know, you know, Coca Cola lives and dies on its brand, for example, and uh, there are B two B tech companies that can survive on a very sophisticated and mature sales organization without a, a mature marketing organization. So it, it is it is different. That's a scary that proposition. Sense. <laughs> it is scary, but uh, not when you start to look at efficiency and growth, especially when it comes to um, uplifting all the activities that an organization does and uh, allowing growth and scale, especially across SMB and, and mid-market, and aligning efforts to a B2B buying landscape where the buyer is in control rather than the seller, since the buyer is more informed than they have ever been, they can do their research online, and by the time they're engaging with a salesperson, oftentimes they're only looking to you know, get a discount. Uh, or get a few kind of last nuanced questions answered. So in terms of how is, is B2B marketing different than, than B2C, it's, it's different in, in, in many areas. The context that I, that I mentioned, uh, but also the fact that you're, you're marketing to, to different groups of people that relate to each other. So, so can, I, talk, can, I, can yeah. I jump on that for a second? And that's a, it's a topic we love to chat about because most marketers love to fixate on a single lead, right? There's mm -hmm. a lead that comes in and they, they qualify or judge a campaign program or channel by the number of leads generated. But we know in the B2B world that more than one person buys from us, right? Sure. Sometimes committees of up to 10 or 20 folks. So how are you at OpenDNS and others um, in this industry measuring the buying behavior or digital body language of companies in this process to understand success or failure in a particular campaign or channel? Mm -hmm. So a couple things. I think you do need to focus on, on leads, and that's part of what a B2B marketer needs to do. And they need to think about different types of leads that they need to acquire, how to speak to them, how to acquire them efficiently across different channels. Absolutely. You know, if you're doing that, keep doing that. But in addition to that, you need to explore pipeline acceleration tactics as well. And once you get there, once you get to the, the point where you've identified a real need at an organization, uh, then you need to do, you know, account-based marketing tactics, understand who's involved uh, at the account, who's influencing it, who might be a champion. Uh, of your product or service, who's making the decision, and really the whole ecosystem at that at that company, and that's the key difference. So in in B two C, you market to different people and different segments, sure. but they're isolated. They're not interacting with each other. In B two B, you market to different groups and different segments, people that have different roles at the company that they're at and that you're selling to, but they're all talking. You have to understand that interconnectedness. Absolutely. Sure. Okay, you mentioned two um, buzzwords that I think are, are hot in, 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 in uh, top of mind for most B2B marketers. One is pipeline acceleration, and the other one is account-based marketing. Mm -hmm. So from, an, from a pipeline acceleration perspective, um, specifically, what have you seen to be successful or maybe um, lessons learned in trying to accelerate you know, these leads and opportunities through the open DNS pipeline, or past experiences, if you will? Mm -hmm. I think it's a mentality that you need to take that Everyone is on a journey, uh, whether they're a lead or an uh, opportunity has already been identified uh, at, at an account. And if they're on this journey, uh, there, there are maybe different stages that they go through on their journey, 
and they may get to those kind of progressive stages at, at varying uh, levels of, of efficiency and effectiveness or conversion um, and at various speeds or, or, or velocities. And the, the thing that I think that's really useful in terms of the, the lessons that I've learned in, in applying different tactics for pipeline acceleration is that um, you, you have to understand that, uh, that uh, brain fart, hold on. Sorry, we'll come right back to it. That's no worry. I mean, it could. Um, I think we're in pipeline acceleration, and, and where I hear most people jump in on pipeline acceleration is, is the notion of personalization. Like you are, you're hitting right on it, right? Like where are they in the buying journey? Understanding mm -hmm. where they're in the buying journey, and then giving relevance, you know, relevant content in, in that process. Um, as you know, as, as oh, I think the point that I wanted to make okay. is is to um, to think of of. Uh, the journey is having various friction points, yep. sticking points. Yep. Like, like there are things that could hold people up uh, in in their journey to becoming a customer. Um, what, what are those typically? What do you, what do you, is it price? Is it uh, you know fear because it's new technology? Is it uh, especially in the security game? Is it you know strength? To get, of it starts security? to get it starts to get really specific. Um, mm -hmm. And and generally, the the closer you become to a customer, the further away that you you are from being a a lead. The, uh, the more detailed and the more nuanced that, that it gets. So if we're, for example, selling a network security solution to an IT security audience at an enterprise-sized account, they may care about you know, SOC 2 um, and you know, whether, whether or not uh, you, know, you can check that box before moving on. And so some of these, some of these things aren't, aren't just tactics, but it's, it's uh, you know, just a discipline of listening to where deals get stuck, where they stall, and um, and how to go about from a from a product and product marketing perspective as well as a demand gen perspective, how to make sure that that runs smoothly, such that uh, someone uh, that you're trying to sell to, to actually sees uh, that you you tick whatever box that is, and they can. And, how, and I, I guess my question there is, how are you interpreting what that major hurdle is, and then how are you giving something of value or reciprocity to get them over that hurdle? And how, you know, or is that through marketing automation that you're able to understand the, the content that they're touching and where they may need the next piece of content? But you know, what are you typically mm -hmm. seeing mm -hmm. in your so, world? So, in terms of the the demand gen tactics and the and the marketing tactics, and taking a step back from some of the kind of more product focused strategies that, that you could you can employ, um, it's around showing value and showing value quickly where it needs to be uh, where it needs to be seen. So if for example, you identify that somebody's a practitioner, somebody is going to actually be using the service that, that you offer, well, a great tactic to, to do is a uh, frictionless free trial. Let them go in, dig in, play with the service on their own. And there's various technologies now where you can, you can pipe in product usage data into your CRM and see who is doing what and offer remediation tactics based on, you know, are they, are they getting stuck in an area of the product? Have they not explored something that um, could be very impactful? Do we see that uh, a prospective customer that does X, Y, Z in a trial converts at 2X the rate of somebody that doesn't? Sure. And if that's the case, then how do we make sure that we, we steer people towards that, that first real aha moment within their, their experience of trialing the product? Okay, fantastic. And in terms of data sets that you're looking at, you know, shifting into the re reporting and, and analytics world, if you will, um, you know what? What types of data do you do you like to dig into? What are you asking your folks to report to you on? Um, and what have you moved beyond? Like, what have you seen that you have been looking at at some point? You said this isn't relevant. It's either too much information. It's not enough information, or it's just not you know salient to, to driving performance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'll start with the stuff that's not interesting to me and that I spend basically zero time thinking about, looking at. Um, it needs to be done elsewhere in the organization to ensure that uh, dependent metrics are, are, are hit. But things like impressions, clicks, click-through rates, um, inquiries, leads, these are things that I spend very little time thinking about. Good for you, because most marketers these days judge themselves solely on what I call tier one analytics, right? Which is just the front end metrics of what they're doing. So. Mm -hmm. I'm on, I'm on bated breath to hear All right. what, what, what we're looking at then. Good to hear. And not to say that they're not important. And, and many organizations don't, haven't even gotten there yet. Sure. Um, and, and so it's a question of like how mature is your B2B organization. And so that's a, a good first step. But then you know, further along in that, that journey there are things like um, you know, opportunities and opportunities that have been qualified and marketing-led revenue. And that's you know, getting a little, little bit better, a little bit more interesting. 
And then you start to see even more mature uh, organizations doing things like understanding the fully loaded cost per acquisition. Um, the cost per sale. Meant, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, looking at that as an, an efficiency KPI uh, over what the customer lifetime value is mm -hmm. and doing that by channel, doing that by acquisition channel. So if you can say, Somebody that comes in through paid search, it costs us blank amount to, to get them across all costs, um, headcount, commissions, uh, advertising spend, everything. And that the people that we get in through that mechanism uh, over the lifetime of their, their experience with us as a, as a customer, sure. um, what does that look like? If you can optimize uh, those those ratios and measure those accurately, then you can run a very efficient business. Okay, I love it. And so the natural question, um, to so peel back the, the layers of the onion from that, or how do you measure attribution? Because in most instances, we would know that it's not direct response or not hitting a paid search page, converting, talking to sales, and buying, right? Mm -hmm. How do you understand how these, these different channels, potentially different campaigns, are woven together to actually pr produce a purchase and then properly attributing what delivered success and what didn't, mm -hmm. if you will? So I can say where, where opening us is at now in okay. terms of what we do, and we, we measure, um, a couple different dimensions. One is what was the one tactic that acquired the record to begin with? Like, how did this person enter our, our CRM? Um, and it could be a direct response. It could be we met them at a trade show. It could be they clicked on a display ad. It could be any of a, a number of things. Fill out a form for a white paper, what have you. And we and we track that and we stamp that and we don't allow anything to overwrite that effort because we want to understand how did how did we start this conversation. But then we take that a step further and say, well, how did we continue this conversation? How did we mature this lead? How do we move this, this record uh, closer to becoming an opportunity? And so uh, for that, we, we think of what are we offering? What value are we providing to our customer? Because marketing's not in charge. Sales isn't in charge. Our customers are in charge. Yeah. And we have to align everything we do to, to them. Yep. And so to that, uh, to that effort, we've, we've built out a uh, taxonomy that uh, is really only looking at what are we providing that is of value to our prospective customers. At the product level or marketing level? The marketing level. Okay. So um, did we give them a white paper? Did we deliver sure. a, you know, did we invite them to an executive dinner and did they participate in that? Did they go to an online event and, and uh, attend one of our webinars? What value did we provide to them? And we measure all of those different touch points separately as uh, separate, you know, kind of campaign touch points. And in terms of attribution, we, we care about what is, what is the first one that, that really worked and that really kind of moved that, that conversation forward? And what was the, the last touch point prior to that lead converting into an opportunity? Which is what a lot of uh, organizations do. And uh, it's a good first step. But are you weaving together from first all the interim steps and to last? I mean, do you understand that full journey at the customer level, or is that is that phase two and phase three for you as you're? We look at influence. So if if someone, for example, met us at a trade show, but then you know a month later they went to a webinar and then they converted to an opportunity and then we won that deal, and then we say, okay, well the primary campaign was that webinar because that was the last thing that happened. That was the last touch point prior to that lead to opportunity conversion. We do, we do look at that, but we don't ignore the, the influence of um, just things that we know um, from a, a less data-driven perspective that were very impactful in that journey. So we'll look back and say, oh yeah, we actually talked to this person for two hours over drinks after this, after this trade show. And yeah, we think that was, was really helpful in this journey. So we look at that influence. But uh, in terms of having a uh, multi-channel multi attribution model, model in place and fully baked, not quite there yet. The, the, that's somewhere that we aspire to get to. So you're heading on that path, which is interesting. You said something that hurt my ears though for a second. You said the not-so-data-driven approach. And we're, I'm a, we're <laughs> a company focused on data, but there's always a time and place for you know, leveraging in intuition and, and, and um, experience. And I'm curious, so when, are, when, are, when do you weave that into the picture? I mean, obviously it's when it's the physical you know, one-on-one um, -on -one interactions, but uh, what else are you using to kind of build that in, bake that into your overall success formula, if you will? Yeah, I think we want to, in general, reduce intuition, reduce kind of guessing and, and non-data-driven decision-making, but we also have All to... All right, I'm feeling a lot better. Thank okay. you. Okay. Yeah, right. I, I saw you getting a little stressed there, so hopefully, hopefully that relaxes bit. you. Um, but we also have to acknowledge that uh, this maturity takes time, and... and um, you can actually go overkill in terms of being too data-driven when you're not sure. yet ready. 
And so given if you have a roadmap for, for more analytical maturity in your organization and you haven't yet um, reached where you want to be at, well, then you should use the next best thing. You can't let lack of, of perfect data just cripple you. Um, you have to use the best information that's available, and sometimes that's the opinion of Joe, the sales guy, who talked to this prospect at this event. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, understood. Um, and you, you talk about um, sophistication of marketing approach and, and data, and as you move down this journey, um, you know, I think a lot of the B two B marketers we talk to are also focused on the the, the organizational journey, if mm -hmm. you will. Um, and I'm curious as to what you've seen with OpenDNS and how your organization is evolving to you know, the changing landscape of, of marketing, but, but also the changing landscape of, of the buyer and how you're modernizing yourself to keep up with those changes at mm -hmm. the organizational level, if that's fair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, big question. Um, I'd say that, that we, we have to acknowledge that there's things that we can do and that there's things that we can. We need to focus on the most important areas within the, the account that we can influence. Um, it may be in our, in our uh, buying motions and selling motions that, uh, that, we, that we undergo that HR can be a line of business that influences an IT security solution. It could be that the legal group influences it or the CFO influences it. Uh, it might be that the sales department that, that has to go out on the road and, and doesn't want a network security solution that slows down their iPhone or their laptop. They might be influencers. But the, the, I think the real challenge is, is acknowledging that decisions are almost infinitely complex and varied across accounts, but to focus on really the, the key variables that account for most of what is going to uh, lead to success or failure okay. in winning, winning a deal. And so um, from that perspective, what, what we do is we just spend a lot of time listening to our customers. Uh, and, and Implicit, explicit data? I mean, how are you? Explicit. How, okay, so, explicit so, conversations. Yeah, and, and making sure that everyone in marketing is on demo calls, um, is you know, out in the field. Uh, at events and talking to prospects and pitching and hearing what they have to say and hearing their opinions in, in real time and where their challenges are. And we learn certain things. So in OpenDNS's example, one of the key learnings, this is a while back, but uh, it was eye-opening at the time, was that while OpenDNS offers a network security solution, it's cloud-delivered and it's DNS-based. And DNS is typically run by a network engineering or network administration function, which sometimes does not, and actually often doesn't reside within the security uh, organization at a company. So you have these these two different people with different motivations and different groups with, within an account, where some person, uh, some the people on the security side, are are motivated by by risk, are motivated by compliance, and and how to ensure that their organization is protected from what in many cases is an onslaught of uh, attacks on their data and their users. Yep. And then on the network side, they they care about uptime, they care about reliability, they they want to make sure there's no outages, and that's really what's near and dear to to their heart. And um, and so you have to you have to talk to both if a decision has to go through both. If the people that care about the benefits of the service um, are different from the people that actually control a decision on on the network side, well, you're going to need to speak effectively to both groups and uh, and get them excited about what you can offer um, to to each of them. And just makes our, our jobs as marketers a little bit more complex and a little bit more difficult. But that understanding's got to be a huge but foundation. Much more for, effective. Yeah, for effectiveness. That's yeah. a great point. Um, Maybe it would be good to, to pivot into some of the campaigns or um, you know channels that you've been involved in, and at a tactical level, talk to me about what you've seen to be successful, where you've combined you know, particular channels together, a particular campaign, um, or unsuccessful, what you've learned from that. So there's a lot of folks out there saying, okay, what are you actually doing, you know, day to day, month to month, that is producing these qualified leads that are turning into mm -hmm. sales? Sure. Um, and I'd, I'd love the little mini case study if if that's fair. Sure. Uh, I'll start with what tends to be a, a, a recipe for failure. Okay. And that's focusing on a, a narrowly defined tactic in isolation. Yep. So say content syndication is a great example. A lot of B2B marketers that are focused on leads will say, okay, well, I can just very easily scale up or scale down content syndication. I can just pay my 
forty dollar cost per lead and you know work with a vendor and just have them send me the right kind of names with the right kind of job titles at the right kind of companies who have filled in their information to receive a piece of content that we've created. If that's all you're doing, you're almost invariably going to fall flat. You'll get leads, but then there's nothing to continue that conversation. There's no reason to progress that conversation, and they tend to stall at the lead level. There's no amplification either. Yep. No. Yep. Um, so what has been a more effective tactic is pairing that with, uh, with lead nurturing tactics. So you, you, for example, you acquire somebody through a content syndication tactic, and then when you do, you put them in a, a marketing automation drip, email marketing campaign. You say, all right, they downloaded asset XYZ. It tells us that we think they're probably broadly interested in this or that subject. So we're gonna continue that, that, that uh, conversation with additional things that we see of value. Uh, or we expect would be a value to the, the prospective customer. And is that prospective value, the next asset you're gonna send them, the next conversation you're trying to stoke, is that based off of data or just your, the intuition of, of you and your team? Intuition right now. Okay. Sure, so if, if we have content that's intended for a security practitioner, we'd continue um, deepening that conversation with more content targeted to, towards that same persona. Uh, we tend to be kind of Problem centric to to begin with, you know, the, following the the kind of tried and true formula of the market is changing, sure. the the landscape is changing. Here's why: get them to acknowledge that yes, there is a problem, and then get that closer and closer and closer to a, a specific category of solution or approach to remediate that that problem, and getting progressively more product focused as we continue that conversation. Okay. Um, but how that's done right now is is definitely not data-driven, it's just based on our intuition. Okay, fair enough, well at least it's being done. Um, one of the last questions I, lo I love asking is, you know, if you were, you know, advising um, the mass of, of B2B marketers out there and you know, giving them some insights around things that should be on their strategic roadmap that probably is not, what would you recommend that they at least give some strong consideration to doing or thinking about? Depends. I mean, you know, it varies from organization to organization. Uh, I would say the biggest area that they should focus on, as you know, kind of broadly applicable in general as as it can be, is spend time marketing the marketing organization internally, um, because marketing as a discipline. So communication internally. Internal communication, Love it. I think, is, Love is it. the thing that gets most often neglected at a, at a modern B2B marketing organization. You've got a bunch of people that are so excited that they have this skill set and the ability to measure growth and revenue in ways that they never could before and can actually you know, take charge of the growth agenda of a, of a company and be involved at the highest levels of, of strategy within their organization. But then what they often neglect to, to, to realize is that People have a lot of preconceived notions of what marketing is. Um, people tend to think oh, everyone's a marketer, right? We all, whether you're an you engineer, you're C level, talk, everyone's a marketer. Sure. Right? <laughs> and so everyone's got an opinion. Exactly. Which is great. You know, yep. lots of uh, opinions coming in can oftentimes get to the best answer and the, the the best ideas, but it can also slow things down in an organization if there's uh, kind of a lack of understanding or a lack of trust. Sure. And so if. 90% of the organization has an understanding of marketing as the arts and crafts organization that just writes some words and makes stuff pretty, then that's going to be problematic if you've got a team that's focused on, you know, delivering a, you know, a predictive, you know, growth model for yep. the entire organization, which is obviously... It's a tough spot to be in if that's the case. Sure. Yep. So I think, you know, the one thing to focus on for, for B2B, marketing, B2B marketers and B2B marketing organizations is to really spend time marketing how uh, their discipline has changed and really the role that they have and the vision that they have um, within B2B marketing. You know, it's so ironic, and that's such a great point, Corlin, because we think about it as marketers, we're in the communication business, right, to some degree or another, and here we are trying to be great communicators to our prospects and our customers, but yet so important is the internal buy-in resources, people understanding alignment between sales and marketing, sales and customer service, but yet we don't do the job we need to to communicate to them to bring them into the fold. Mm -hmm. um, so easily overlooked, right? But often probably huge, um, huge opportunity for, uh, for growth within an organization. Definitely. That's a great point. It's really hard to put focus there, especially when you're passionate about growth and you know that the tactics and skill set that you have can produce it. It's tough when you're you're racing for for market share or whatever the goals of your company are and you know you can help 
to say, okay, I'm going to actually cut off part of my day and not do that and instead uh, spend time on organizational health, alignment, and internal awareness of what the marketing organization is doing. And there you have it, Cortland Smith of OpenDNS. Thank you, Cortland. Thanks. That was fantastic. Thanks.